Gloucester Gladiator was Britain's last and finest biplane fighter. Designed by H.P. Folland, the prototype first flew in September 1934. This stunning example can still be seen in the air thanks to the world-famous Shuttleworth collection at Old Warden Aerodrome in Bedfordshire. Well, I always wanted to fly at Old Warden, ever since I was a boy and, and first heard about the place. There was something about it that attracted me. Uh, I was very lucky. I joined the, the Royal Air Force. I became a test pilot, which is almost a prerequisite for flying here. And as soon as I could, I managed to get my foot in the door. I would say of the aircraft I've flown at the collection, the Gladiator is one of the real classics. She's a beautiful handling aeroplane and a real unique example, and in fact the only example of her type flying in the world at this moment. Former Mosquito pilot David Ogilvy has spent a lifetime in aviation. The Gloucester Gladiator is one of many aircraft he has flown in his illustrious career. It's one he came to know well during his time as general manager of the Shuttleworth collection. It, it was owned by the Gloucester Aircraft Company, its makers, for a very long time. But as the Gloucester Aircraft Company was merged into other organisations, the Hawker Siddeley Group, the aircraft was handed over by Gloucester's to the Shuttleworth collection. The chief pilot here at Shuttleworth was also chief test pilot at Gloucester's, so it's fairly clear why, how and where that came about. But it now joins the collection here as a very special historic aeroplane in a very special collection of old aeroplanes dating from before the First World War until just after the end of the Second World War. The rapid expansion of the RAF saw 14 new fighter squadrons formed between 1936 and 1937. During this time, the Air Ministry ordered gladiators in their hundreds. With over 200 sold abroad, the final tally of aircraft produced was 648. The features of this particular aeroplane were quite, uh, quite unique for a biplane. It was, I believe, the only closed cockpit fighter, certainly the only closed cockpit English uh, fighter biplane. Uh, it's got four machine guns, there's flaps on the top and bottom wings for reducing the landing speed. So quite an innovative aeroplane. One of Britain's biggest pre-war export successes, the Gladiator saw active service with many countries. With its potent armament, harmonised controls and 840 horsepower Bristol Mercury engine, she was arguably the ultimate biplane fighter. It's um, quite a big engine, it's um, nearly 25 litres and when you compare that with your average car of one, two litres, you've almost got three litres per cylinder. It was designed by Roy Fedden at Bristol's and he was almost the world leader on radial engines of the time. Particularly with these engines, you have the four valves per cylinder, which is um, something that's come in in cars in the last 10 or 15 years. It's supercharged, uh, where you actually draw the air in through the air intake, pass it through the carburetor, which is similar to car practice, but then it is pressurized by the supercharger and blown into the cylinders under pressure for the high power settings. So you're effectively forcing more mixture into the cylinders and hence more power. Before we fly any aircraft, it's normal procedure to do a power run to check that everything is working normally. So we would start the aeroplane up in a normal fashion. We would give it a long time uh, to warm up. And then we'd set uh, a reasonably high power setting and we check the two ignition systems by switching each off in turn to make sure they're working correctly and just check that the aeroplane engine is performing properly before we take off. Although at the outbreak of war it was coming obsolete with the introduction of the Hurricane and slightly later the Spitfire, it did serve operationally during the war and one squadron, number 247, was used in the Battle of Britain to defend Plymouth Dockyard. After that it served a lot overseas in Malta, Middle East, Norway and so on. So it did actually fight quite actively. It's still an effective fighter because of the manoeuvrability and the firepower. There's four of these on it, which was not bad for the start of World War II. Uh, and she did give a good account of herself in those 30s. Before securing a position in aviation history by becoming the first pilot to exceed a thousand miles an hour, a young trainee fighter pilot named Peter Twiss cut his teeth on the Gladiator at the Naval Fighter School in Yeovilton. 
and the aircraft we had here were gladiators, skewers, rocks, full miles. Uh, so there was an opportunity to fly all those, but we all enjoyed the gladiator most of all. And the gladiator was kept fully armed, actually, in the event of a, an air raid, it could be used to, as a fighter. And uh, I was just about to go off on one day when there was a report of some heavy air raids in the Southampton area. So I went off and thought I'd climb up and see if I could see any signs of activity. Um, which I did, and I climbed up to about 12, 14,000 feet, uh, looking toward, in the general direction of Southampton and Portsmouth, and certainly saw nothing. And um, I was on my way back, still at quite high, and suddenly two Spitfires zoomed past me, and I thought, <coughs> I'm glad they weren't shooting at me, because they would have got me. And I did hear later that there were some CR-42s amongst the aircraft at Southampton, which they could easily have mistaken for, for a, a gladiator. Anyway, I got a good bollocking when I landed from my instructor for attempting to do anything like that. As you can see there, with the nose stuck up in the air, I was weaving it from side to side when taxiing, because I can't actually see what it's going towards. It's directionally unstable on the ground. You have to pay very, very close attention on takeoff and landing to keeping straight. The one thing that catches the first time pilot out slightly is the rudder is very, very light and sensitive. You do get used to that, but it's a thing you have to get used to on the first flight. And of course, you're flying it more or less by the seat of the pants, as they used to say. I do remember the first time when I flew the Gladiator. Um, a great privilege, as it always is with the old airplanes. But as soon as I got it into the air and got it into the climb, uh, I put it to the natural angle to get the thing going skywards, looked at my notes and it said the speed was 80, looked at the ASI, it was exactly 80 miles an hour. So it's a natural aeroplane that automatically goes to the ideal position that you require to get the best out of it. Uh, rapidly after that, it becomes obvious that you've got a delightful fighting machine in your hand, very positive in pitch and roll, uh, relatively stable in yaw, and quite a powerful motor. Um, so, delightful experience. Very nice aeroplane. I think some aeroplanes actually ask to be flown, some definitely don't. But uh, the Gladiator is one that asks to be flown and asks to be enjoyed, really. I mean, it's a, an aeroplane that you can't help enjoy. I don't know what it's like operationally, but when you're flying in, in peaceful countryside over Bed in Bedfordshire, uh, it's, it's very pleasant. It's very important that aircraft such as this be kept flying so that people today uh, who read about them in books, comics, and what have you can see and feel what the aircraft are like in the air. Old Warden's the only place in the world where you can see most of the aircraft we have because they're unique. And you can see them in operation. We try and show the sight and the sound of the airplane in the air rather than have them dead and sitting in a museum. It's always a thrill to fly these classic aircraft and aircraft such as this will take a pilot back to the real roots of his flying. Lots of modern aeroplanes, both military and civilian, rely on highly automated systems to enable them to do an excellent job, but in many ways that's taken the fun out of flying. With aeroplanes such as the Gladiator, the pilot's taken back to the real roots of flying. Engine handling is not automatic, there are no autopilots, it's just a lovely pilot's aeroplane to fly. From a pure pilot's point of view, the Gladiator is the nearest thing to a perfect aeroplane you can find, I think. <laughs>